All righty, well, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne, the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And my co-host today is Cindy Warwick, who is in charge of our author talk series. Um, before we jump in into the introduction and the presentation, I just had a house, few housekeeping items I wanted to go over. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program today. So please feel free to submit them at any time using the questions box in the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, this program is being recorded, so a link to the recording will be sent out to everybody who registered in the coming days. So please look for that in your email. And one last thing I have for you is just a brief overview of the dashboard for those of you who might not be familiar. Uh, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard is going to look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. Uh, first and foremost, in the you have your audio section here. Um, if you have any problems connecting to the computer audio, you can check to make sure that the device is correctly connected, or you can always switch to the phone call too as well um, if that helps. At any point, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button here. You can hit that button, that will alert me, and I will send you a message in GoToWebinar and hopefully be able to solve any problems that you are having. And lastly, there is a questions box at the bottom here. So please type in your questions. If you have any there, hit send, and we'll be happy to, to address them at the end of the program. So um, that is everything that I have for you. So Cindy, take it away. Thanks so much, Andrew, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm glad that you could uh, join us today for this <laughs> author talk about the Franklin Park tragedy, a forgotten story of racial injustice in New Jersey. We, uh, I hope you check the website periodically. We have some great webinars coming up. Um, on the 17th is the financial side of college graduation. Um, something that we don't always want to think about, but it, it is there and it's a realization. So that would be a, a great webinar for any of those who have graduations coming up in that. And then on the 18th, uh, in coordination with May being National Stroke Awareness Month, we have what is a stroke? And that's going to cover the signs and symptoms, the risk factors, the management of risk factors, and treatment. So I think that'll be a great one as well. Our next talk uh, for the author series is on June 9th, and it is with a gentleman named John Barrows. He's the editor, editor of Mama's Timeline Org. His talk is Wreckers, Land Pirates of Mammoth County. Um, he's going to be using proprietary research findings to examine the questions of who were the wreckers of Monmouth County, how did they compare with the people of similar shipwreck-prone areas of the world, were they guilty of the heinous crime accusations they received, and how did they influence the formation of the U.S. Coast Guard? So I hope you'll register for that talk as well and join us on that day. Um, that is for June 9th. Today, though, Let's go back to the Franklin Park tragedy because I think it's a, a little known story that does need to be heard. And I'd like you to like to introduce you to our speaker, Brian Armstrong. And he is, sorry about that, my TV came on in the background for some unknown reason. Um, he's an independent historian, researcher, and author. He's a native of New Jersey and a current resident of Mount Laurel. Laurel and, he was president of the South River Historical and Preservation Society for 10 years, and he's now the vice president, Central Region, for the League of Historical Societies of New Jersey. In 2015, he co-wrote South River, published by Arcadia Publishing, with Stephanie Bartz and Nan Whitehead. He also frequently writes articles for the Bar Harbor Historical Society in Bar Harbor, Maine, where his mother's family lived for several hundred years. And in 2021, his book, A History Lover's Guide to Bar Harbor, Maine, was released by Arcadia Publishing. He also lectures throughout the state on local history, prohibition, the 19th Amendment, World War I, the Spanish influenza, and political history. So please welcome Brian Armstrong with me. Thanks for being with us today, Brian. We look forward to what you're gonna share. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to, uh, to see you here. And um, just wanted to kind of give you a quick overview of the Franklin Park tragedy. Um, and we, I will uh, get into this. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to start out with, though, is to tell you a story of um, that happened. Uh, oops, I got to move my cursor here. I'm not going down here. One second here. Okay, thank you. Um, in 1945, my father uh, had just completed um, his basic training 
in uh, up in Great Lakes uh, for World War II in the Navy. And uh, he um, went down to Chicago and decided to have a nice meal at the Palmer House, which was a fancy place at the time. And so he went into the dining room there and he had a nice dinner and sat down next to a family, an African-American family. And at the conclusion of the dinner, um, they had paid their bill, left the restaurant, and then the maitre d' came in and, sub and smashed all the dishes in front of all the people that were there. That was a racial injustice. And what I'm gonna talk about today is a racial injustice that took place in New Jersey back in, the eight, in 1894. Um, the reason for writing this book, um, I was doing some research on African-American history for South River, New Jersey, where I was the president. And as I went through this, I discovered this story in the newspaper. And I was like, this is a story that really needs to be told. And also one of the things that uh, I always enjoy are hidden historical events that really had not, gotten, not been given proper coverage you know, over the years. And newspapers are a great source of finding stories that you never really, uh, you know, had kind of been lost for history. And so as I went through, I found more and more articles about it. And as I searched on, I found that this story had become a worldwide story that it had actually gone as far as New Zealand, where I found newspapers that had covered this story. And I felt the topic was relevant because it was involving race in America, uh, which is an important issue today. Just a little background on Franklin Park. It's a small little area and it's kind of an interesting place because it's divided by Route 27 and two different counties. One side of the road is Middlesex County. The other side is Somerset. At the time of when the murders took place, the population was very small there. It was only about 400 people lived there. Today, there's about 13,000. Um, today, the, the, the population is very diverse. Back in those days, it was divided uh, between about 15% black and 85% white, primarily most of them were of Dutch background. And um, the 15% that was black there, most of them were descendants of people who had been slaves in New Jersey. You didn't have a situation like you have uh, today where there's people that come from all different parts of the country. It was primarily New Jersey-based people that lived here. Um, so now I'm going to tell you is 10 reasons why I think you should read the book. I uh, find it a very interesting book, and I think I hope, hopefully you will as well. The first thing is uh, the murders, the funeral, and the Eden Museum, um, which uh, are kind of the key, the core uh, to the story. Um, the murders took place on March 1st, uh, 1894, and uh, shortly after that there was the funeral and then there is a, the museum got involved in that. Where the murders took place um, were, if, you, if you're at all familiar with Franklin Park, there's a new school, school called the Claremont School, Claremont Road School, which is where the Henry Rule Farm is in this picture. And across the street, you've got the Jacob Van Sickle House, uh, which still survives today. That's the house on the top here. And Moore Baker's house, where the murders took place, is was a small house that was next to it. Actually, it was a large house, I should say. And uh, uh, between that and the Nine Mile Run, Nine Mile Run Creek, um, his father's house, John J. Baker's house, survives today. Sadly, the white oak tree that sat in the middle of the road back in those days, and people had to navigate with their carriage, is long gone. But th this was the way of this community. The roads were all dirt. It was a very um, quiet place. If you go there today, you cannot drive down Claremont Road with not having a car behind you. I can assure you in 1894, there were very few people on the road. This is the way the area looks today. If you look down where the trees are that down there, that is the area where the farmhouse would have been and where the murders took place. Across the street is where the new uh, school is. This house is ever since I started getting involved in this and reading about it, when I saw the pictures in the newspaper of the house, the house fascinated me because it's a very unusual looking house. If you look at the house on the second floor where the, um, the windows are, that's where the murders took place in that room. The two circular um, uh, kind of globes on the side there are windows that illuminate the stairs that people would walk up to the rooms uh, because it, and this was a time before we had electricity. And this is an area that was you know, very remote and not uh, urbanized. 
the night of March 1st, uh, Lucretia Baker, who is 26 years old, and her daughter Gertrude Baker, who is 15 months, months old, were murdered uh, in their bedroom on the second floor of the house. Um, the story that is told by the husband is that they were all asleep in the bed and two uh, African-American intruders entered the, the room and attacked them, killed the mother and killed the uh, daughter. And then the husband fought off the two attackers, killing the first attacker after getting the ax away from him and hitting him in the head several times. And then the second attacker, he grabbed his shotgun and shot him in the head. This is a diagram of the room. You see the mother is on the bed, the baby in the cradle where they were killed. Uh, Willard Thompson is by the doorway uh, where he was killed with the ax by Moore Baker. And then the man in the back is Henry Baker and he is uh, shot in the back room. Now, just to give you some perspective, I talked to people who had lived in this house and as late as the 1950s, there were still blood stains on the floor in this particular room that they had a hard time getting uh, rid of after all that time. Moore Baker, uh, 22 years old, the only survivor that night from the attack. Uh, he is, this is a contemporary photo, uh, picture of him on the left. Uh, this is him in the middle about 20 years later, an actual photograph of him. And the photo on the right is him in his, when he's in his 80s. And as you can see on the right side of his head, there's a bump and he claims that that bump uh, he received the night of the attack by being hit in the head by uh, Willard Thompson. So what happens is after the murders take place and he kills the two attackers, Morg Baker uh, fled the house. It was about 28 degrees outside, snow on the ground. He had just his uh, shirt on, uh, his night shirt on covered with blood and there was a half moon in the sky and he followed along with the only light that he had to go to the doctor's office that was about a mile down the road. This is a map of that era. And the thing that's fascinating is if you look on the one side of the street here over this way, a lot of these houses still survive today. The church, the six mile run church still is there as well. And Moore Baker came down the road and he went to the house right before the hotel, which was the Van uh, Dever house, where the doctor's house was. One of the things to look on this picture, too, if you look in the middle of Route 27, you'll see a flagpole and hay scales. Those are no longer there, but you can see this was a very uh, simple uh, time for this area where the roads were all dirt roads and it was primarily carriage and horses that were there. This is the house that Moore Baker approached. It is now a private residence. He came to the door at, at one o'clock, actually 2 a.m. in the morning, knocking on the door. And uh, as uh, the doctor came to the door, he saw a man covered with blood who was completely freezing and, from the cold weather. Now, if this happened today, a doctor would immediately call an ambulance and send the person to the hospital. Uh, instead, what the doctor says is, get on your horse, ride back to your father's house, get some clothes, and let's go see the murder site. So Moore Baker gets on his horse, rides back to his father's house, which again survives today, gets into his brother's clothes, his brother, his father, go over to the house and meet the doctor. When they come to the house, this is again the, another shot of the house, they come upstairs and uh, Moore Baker's father reports that the first thing he sees as he enters the door is he sees his uh, daughter-in-law in the bed covered with blood and he sees his grandchild lying face down in the crib dead. And so then what they do now is notify uh, the coroner. Uh, this must have been a pretty lazy coroner because he does decides not to come until about 10 a.m. the next day. In the meantime, the word gets out to all the other farmers and about 500 people arrive at the farm the next morning. And if you talk about a compromised crime scene, all the people wanted to come and see what had happened. So they entered the front door, went up the stairs, went into the room and visual and saw what had, had happened. And about you know, 500 people came through that day. So finally at 10 a.m., the coroner arrives he does his inspection of the crime scene and look, and the doctor looks at the bodies and then they have the inquest. 
So more Baker goes into the inquest. Only more Baker and the doctor are the ones who are interviewed for the inquest with 12 neighbors that have been recruited as the uh, ones who are the evaluators. The evidence that Moore Baker provides is that he had shown a $100 bill to Henry Baker earlier that day, and he believed that Henry Baker and Willard Thompson had conspired to attack him at his house. Uh, earlier in that night, he had there had been a report that his carriage had been taken by the two men who went to Dayton to get drunk. And then uh, Boyd, Boyd, uh, Boyd Breaker, his brother, said that he found materials in the basement that indicated they were going to burn the house down. Now, Willard Thompson was said to have killed the wife and child with the axe. Moore Baker fought him off and then hit him two, or th two to four times in the head, and that Thompson was possibly drunk. Henry Baker um, tried to strangle him, ran to the back room, and then Baker shot him in the head. Now, Baker felt that Henry Baker had been the um, the one that was the organizer of it. Now you'll notice his name is Baker and also the people that are being attacked are Baker. They are actually uh, related in a sense that Moore Baker's great grandfather or grandfather was the master of Henry Baker's grandfather. So there is this connection through slavery of the family. Uh, Dr. Hoagland testifies also in the inquest about the wounds the inquest meets for 15 minutes, and in, the two attackers are convicted of being guilty of murder, and Moore Baker is, is said that he only used self-defense to kill them and is uh, exonerated. Afterwards, Moore Baker says he wants the bodies of the two attackers removed from the house. They're going to throw them out the window, but the coroner says, no, you can't do that. So they carry them outside, put them by the side of the house, and then later the bodies are thrown in the road like roadkill. And then the people around there decide that they want to burn the bodies. So they start a fire and they're gonna burn the, you know, the two uh, bodies of the two uh, alleged attackers. And then the uh, person who's in charge of the poor comes the overseer of the poor and grabs the bodies before they're burned, throws them in the back of his carriage and several men chase him down the road trying to still get possession of the bodies to burn them, uh, but they, he's able to bring them to the alms house where they are properly buried. The alms house, if anybody's familiar with Franklin Park or Franklin Township area, the library is on DeMott Lane and Gates Road at the very end is where the, uh, the place uh, where the alms house would have been at that time. And across the water at the bottom is where the cemetery would have been where the people were buried. Now, what makes this story a little stranger, a day later, they came and actually dug the bodies up and buried them somewhere else because they claimed they were afraid that they were going to be, uh, you know, uh, desecrated because people were, you know, kind of in a, in a fury over the whole uh, murders. This is an interesting thing that I found after I had finished writing the book. This is actually a contemporary diary talking about the funeral, um, which is really exciting for me to find because most of the information that I've used for this book has come from newspaper accounts because there's really not a lot of firsthand uh, primary sources. So this was an exciting source that actually talked about the funeral, which happened a few days after the murder. What the account says is, went to the funeral for Mrs. Moore Baker and child who were killed March 1st by two colored burglars, Thompson and Baker, it was a very large funeral. People coming from great distance and roads were very, very bad. Yeah, the roads were horrible. Over 2,000 people arrived for this funeral. The church itself uh, is in this, there's the church in the center of this picture right now. And you can see these roads. These are the roads. This is taken around the turn of the century. So you get an idea of this clogged with carriages and people and horses, thousands of people and um, they all arrive. And a lot of this had to do with the racial aspect of the crime, which consi was considered something that kind of you know, uh, electrified people. The church uh, looked like this at the time. So you can imagine the grounds in front of the church just surrounded with thousands of people. And then this is a, a drawing that we had created to show the bodies of the mother and child being brought in the casket through the front of the church. Now, this was highly unusual. Most caskets came in through the side, but because it was a double casket with mother and child in the casket, 
it came in through the front door, which also created a lot more notoriety with all the people surrounded waiting outside. Inside the church, this is actually a photograph from this time period. This church looks almost identical inside today if you go and visit it. The only difference is in the front part section where there's that open area, there's now an organ in there that was uh, installed around the turn of the century there. But everything else, the chairs and the pews are all the same. Now these pews would have all been assigned to families. So those families would have been there at the funeral that day because the Baker family were a very prominent family. And so you can imagine those thousands of people were all crammed outside of the building, looking in the windows at this funeral. It was an open casket, and the casket would have looked like this with the mother and child together in the casket. And apparently they did whatever they could for Mrs. Baker because she had actually had head wounds from the ax that they had to, uh, to take care of. This picture at the, the picture on the left is actually the minister that conducted the service. On the bottom here is an actual picture of that time period that shows what the roads look like. So this is, a, this is actually the road to the cemetery that they drove that day when the funeral was completed to bury uh, Lucretia and Gertrude. And this is the grave marker which exists today for them. What happens next gets kind of weird. The day after the funeral, uh, Moore Baker is contacted by um, this museum in New York called the Eden Musee. And it was a big wax museum, kind of like a Madame Tussauds wax museum, but it was one of the most popular sites in New York at that time. It was only, uh, I think it was more popular than the Statue of Liberty, they said. And so everybody would go there to see different displays of prominent people, presidents, and kings and things like that and they had a thing called the crypt or the chamber of horrors and in there they had a lot of different things about kind of what you'd call frontier justice where things different crimes took place and different people dealt with them and this was considered a great idea of frontier justice where a crime was committed and a man actually took justice in his own hands and and took out the two uh, people that were responsible and so they wanted all the artifacts and Moore Baker sold all the things in the house that were associated with the murders to uh, the, the museum, and they came and carted them away, including everything that the bloodstained sheets and all the, the axe and uh, the gun and everything. This turned a lot of people in the community against Moore Baker because they felt this was horrendous that he would have done this. And then shortly after this, he had an auction where he just sold all his wife's belongings off and everything and left town. Now, Moore Baker is the number two reason to buy the book because he is just such a fascinating individual. You just don't know what he is. Is he a hero, like he was projected in the paper, you know, being this guy that, you know, rescued his family? Is he just kind of this mystery enigma? Or is he a villain, as a lot of people indicate that maybe he, there was more to the story that, than what he presented at the inquest? In the newspapers shortly after that, all over the world, there were stories about the, the Franklin Park tragedy. And the term Franklin Park tragedy was on everybody's lips for a short period of time. Again, as I mentioned, he sold off everything to the museum and all the other belongings and left town. Then he came back and a year later, he was on the bridge coming back from New Brunswick and he was attacked and almost killed uh, on the bridge. And it was believed by the Thompson family and the descendants of Henry Baker. He married again, had a son, was divorced and remarried a third time and had two daughters. He later sued Abraham Beekman, one of the richest men in the area who, because Beekman had called him a, a horse thief. And then in the uh, Philly newspaper in 1903, there was a whole story that said that he confessed to the murders on his deathbed. But then it was found that he wasn't in his deathbed and that the story had been fake news. Uh, but wonder, people wonder who planted this story. And then he died at the age of 83 with no mention of the Franklin Park tragedy in his obituary, just quietly in New Jersey. The third reason for buying the book is really to understand New Jersey slavery and how it's possible that an expulsion and a sundown town could occur in New Jersey. I mean, I've read quite a number of books about expulsions and sundown towns, but I never thought in my wildest dreams that it took place in New Jersey. 
And uh, as you go through and you kind of learn the history, and I try to present that in the book about just the connection between the, the type of slavery that took place in New Jersey, which was with Dutch families. And it was a different kind of slavery. It was a much more of a thing where the, the Dutch farmers and the slaves kind of lived together. There wasn't this separation. It was a much smaller number of slaves. Uh, and the slaves were used a lot for farming work and actually clearing um, forests because New Jersey was an incredibly wooded uh, place. And in fact, the Tocqueville had said when you traveled from New York to Philly, you had a whole canopy of trees as you drove along. Uh, that canopy of trees over years were destroyed so that you had farmland. And there weren't enough people to do that. So they brought in slaves to Perth Amboy and other slave areas uh, to clear the clear the, uh, the farms for New Jersey. They set up a gradual uh, abolition, which took place between uh, 1804 to 1946, where slaves would gradually be uh, freed. A lot of times people freed them in their wills, and then they kind of aged out by the uh, 1840s. There were very few of people in slavery uh, in New Jersey. Uh, most of the black residents of Franklin Park in 1894 were related to a local freed slave. About a month after the murders is when the second part of the Franklin Park tragedy occurred. And that was when the people in the town had an expulsion of the black residents. And this is an article that appeared in the newspaper that basically says that an action of the Law and Order League of this place was taken for ordering all the Negroes to leave Franklin Park by Saturday night, which because it caused a commotion amongst the settlers. The League was induced to take this step on account of a feeling of unsafety among the white residents since the horrible Baker tragedy when Mrs. Baker and her infant were murdered by two Negroes. And this began the whole process here. And what happened was, this group, the Law and Order League, which actually they call it the Law and Order League here, but had a different name, uh, actually. And they set out notifications and, meet, and had meetings to basically tell the farmers to expel their residents. Uh, Maggie Miggins, who was the mother of Henry Baker, one of the attackers, shortly after the murders, confronted farmers and said that her son and Willard Thompson were innocent. And then other black residents also may have also challenged more Baker's story. And so this tension started to develop over the next month and the farmers felt that they had to, to uh, expel the people that lived there. Now expelling them from Franklin Park meant that they went to live in South Middlebush and other neighboring communities. So they were still in the area and what the Franklin Park farmers wanted to do was to utilize their labor, but didn't want them to live among them, which is what they basically is what a sundown town is, where you go there for, during the day, and at the end of the day, you have to leave. This store, uh, which is a primary store in the area, is where the notifications were put up, as well as the school and other places. These notifications were not for the black residents, because the most of the black residents could not read and write. They were for the farmers to try to pressure them to get rid of their uh, uh, black workers who were living on their farms. A textbook expulsion is a real or perceived crime, overreaction of the community, notification to leave, intimidation, threat or act of lynching, sundown designation, sundown town designation. And the one thing that Franklin Park uh, expulsion did not have, uh, did not have in it was the, the property rights being removed. Usually in ones in the South and other locations, they actually take the property from people and then throw them out of the area. In the case of Franklin Park, the probably about five or six property owners that were African-American retained their property. But within 10 years, all of those people left the area. Um, most of them were elderly and when they died, their children or descendants decided to move somewhere else. So in a way it was, complete expulsion. One group defied it, which was the Aid and Detective Society of Franklin Park. They were some prominent white residents. Uh, they were almost, they were kind of the quasi police force and they completely disagreed with the group and kept their uh, black workers living on their farms. Uh, this was the Saidam family, 
and the Cordelou family. Uh, if you see Cordelou Road and Sidam Road, those are the families that resisted the expulsion. The Sundown Town designation really followed from the church going up Claremont Road and uh, Pleasant Plains Road and Claremont Road all the way up uh, to South Middlebush Road. And from the next 25 years, that whole area was free of any uh, black residents living there. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the racist media at the time. Um, if the word Negro was used in the newspaper, it could be used as a noun or a pronoun. And if as a noun, it would be um, usually like, well, that would like evil Negro, awful Negro, you know, evil, terrible, some type of negative term. If it was a pronoun, it'd be like Negro, murderer, Negro, rapist. It was always a negative thing. And I actually went to the newspaper and I was searching through it just to see how many of these cases I could find. And there were numerous accounts of negative use of the word Negro. Uh, news coverage of the lynchings were reprinted without condemnation because there were lynchings going on during this era that were all over and they would just put them in the paper like, oh yeah, just another lynching in Mississippi. And then in the New Brunswick Times, said the best way to stop lynching is to not commit lynching offenses. Uh, and one story about a resident who was fairly prominent, a black resident in the area, Cato Hoagland, he owned his own house and had eight, eight acres of land. Uh, a man went to live him, a man named Cornell, and this one article came out and said, a white man named Cornell has moved from Clyde Station to this place and is living with Cato Hoagland, a colored man. Circumstances have made him colorblind and his taste seems to be in need of repair. Uh, the one newspaper from the area though that staunchly was against lynching was the Home News. One of the things in the book that I, th I thought was really special is I talk about the white residents that lived in the area, which there was a lot of information written on them. You know, the Sidams, the Cordelous, the Garretsons, the Hagmans, the Bakers. But I also have profiles of the African-American residents like Cato Hoagland, Aaron Hush, Aaron Statz, George and Isabella Thompson, George Miggins, George Titus. And this is kind of an unusual thing because usually their names appear on maps and other places without any kind of explanation of their lives. And what I tried to do is go through records and create profiles of these individuals. Um, Aaron Hush, for instance, actually, uh, participated in the Civil War and fought. And he had to actually go to Pennsylvania to enlist because New Jersey would not allow black residents to fight in the Civil War. The uh, Robert Mettler, who was the Franklin Park historian, one of the nice things I heard about this book is he, was, he said he was very pleased with these profiles of the African-American residents of the area. And one of the things that's interesting that kind of followed was some of the things that exist that are African-American, um, you know, remnants of this era. Uh, there's the Cato Hoagland House, which has been preserved in Newtown over in Piscataway. It's actually the administrative building there. I found that out to my surprise that when they decided to move it from uh, Franklin Park, they moved it out there. So that's actually the house he lived in. Uh, the Titus Farm uh, is a park that's in the area. Uh, the one that's down at the bottom here, the two graves that are one that's half broken is the Aaron Statz graves. And he was a very, he was a prominent black resident. And he, um, this area that surrounds his grave, I believe is an African-American cemetery because it's the one section of the cemetery where his grave is in there and there's no other graves, which would make me think that probably if you did ground penetrating radar, you'd find other bodies in that area. And then this is a cemetery for Aaron Hush that was preserved right next to a development because he was a veteran of the Civil War and the American Legion fought to preserve this land and this cemetery. One of the things I did in the book is I had a lot of really interesting photos. Uh, Martin Garretson provided most of the photos. He was a photographer from that era and he's a very interesting man. And in fact, uh, my next book, I have a chapter on him. He's one of the people that saved the American buffalo from extinction. He worked very hard on that. He was a resident of Franklin Park and he photographed a lot of the area, um, you know, when he was younger. And there's his, his pictures are great. They're in the book. This picture on the top of this man with his wife on his lap 
is a very unusual picture. This was taken around the turn of the century. Most photos at this in this era were posed in, uh, you know, kind of uh, very st static kind of uh, uh, type environments. This is a very natural picture. I think it's really a cool picture. It was on a glass print. It was actually taken right at Laird's Corner in Franklin Park. And then uh, Lauren Curtis did the drawings that appear in my book because some of the things like the uh, the double casket and some of the other scenes we needed to recreate. This is number seven reason is the Coleman family. And what happens is after the expulsion and after the 25 years of a sundown town, John J. Baker, the father of Moore Baker, leaves the area and sells his farm to Frank Morton. Frank Morton comes in there and him with a few other residents like Georgiana Sidam and Isidore Adler, who actually had moved from, he was a, a, a Jewish businessman who moved from um, New York City, came out there, and they had much more different ideas about who they would sell their land to. And they sold land to the Coleman family and other black uh, people that came from the South, uh, primarily from Virginia and the Carolinas. And uh, this changed the, the whole community again. And there you had this house at the bottom, which was the Coleman house. And these are the Coleman's uh, right here. And uh, actually, when I went and spoke to a member of the Coleman family, and I said, I want to feature, you know, your family in my book, and I'm going to, um, you know, I want to include photographs. She said, why are we in your book? I said, because you're the happy ending. You're how the area uh, transformed itself to the diverse place that it is today. And uh, you know she provided these great pictures of her family. And this is one of the stories of American history that's fascinating with the great migration of people coming up from the South. And this, this uh, changed the kind of the population um, of New Jersey where it was no longer the descendants of New Jersey slaves. It became um, you know, other people from other places. Number eight reason for buying the book is the surviving buildings. Uh, if you go, into the area, you know, you would say, does, did anything survive? Because the area looks so built up and there's so many strip malls and other things. And as I went to write this book, I was so happy to find these treasures, these buildings that have survived all these years. And I'm the son of an architect. So, um, you know, buildings, you know, fascinate me a lot. And these old venerable buildings have survived. They have the one on the top left there is the Baker homestead. And this is the house where uh, Moore Baker was born and um, where his father lived. And this is the house that he came to that night, uh, you know, uh, after the attack. The one on the top right is the Garretson house. This is where Lucretia Baker, before she was married, had lived and where her sister ended up living. On the bottom left is the store that I had talked about before, where the notifications were put up concerning the uh, expulsion they were put in that store today it's an apartment house and then on the bottom left or bottom right is the house where Moore Baker went to that night uh, where Dr. Hoagland's office was. Number nine theme is the theme of rejecting group blame for actions of individuals and justice for all. I mean one of the things that just struck me here is even if the facts are correct that Moore Baker presented and that two men came into the house and murdered the daughter and the uh, wife, it didn't give justification for vigilantes to throw every person of you know, a particular race out of the community. And I thought that that's something that you know, needed to be brought up you know, in, in the book. And again, the tenth one, of course, is the controversy. What I've tried to do with the book is to present evidence and not really to take a side in what people feel. Because as soon as I started writing this book, people immediately started questioning the Moore Baker accounts. And I actually had contemplating doing, doing a chapter about what I'd consider the controversy about it. But I decided to leave it up to the, to the readers and just prevent, present all the evidence that I could find so that you can look at it and decide yourself. But there are questions about what happened in that room that night, or Baker's version versus other theories. And one individual, Thomas Buckingham, who I spoke to at length, had lots of different theories about what possibly happened that night. 
things that have happened, the public response of the book, which has been very great for me, is that first off, I found this account that I had shown earlier, the diary, that that actually was a primary source. That really was a very exciting thing to me. I, you know, I wish there were more letters or other things that people had written about it because it was pretty huge at the time. I mean, people were, you know, collecting actual artifacts from the murders and had them in their houses and there was all kinds of things like that. And then I had a book signing when a descendant from Willard Thompson's family, one of the attackers, uh, alleged attackers, came in to talk to me after the signing and she said, according to her family, the version they had was that Willard Thompson was hit on the head by his boss with a shovel uh, because he was having, the, the boss thought he was having an affair with his wife, which created a whole different spin on the story. And for their, the family, it was fascinating to learn that he was this missing person in their family tree. They always considered his death at the age of 18 years old, like a huge tragedy to the family, which is totally a different angle to everything you know, that had presented you know, in the newspapers and everything concerning Willard Thompson, who at the time, even someone said was, uh, could not even kill a chicken. He was so uh, much, uh, you know, concerned about the sight of blood. So it was kind of a, unusual to see him in the role of this vicious murderer. The victim's sister's family also contacted me. This was Lucretia Baker's family. And they indicated that they had felt from the beginning that Moore Baker had actually done the murders and that the two men had been framed. Um, Dr. Uh, Robert Mettler had uh, contacted me and said he also had spoke to some old time residents who had their doubts about the facts of the case. And then the inquest foreman, uh, Mr. Laird, he had actually told his family, which passed down to me that he became a, a skeptic as well after time after he had been part of the group that actually, you know, were part of the inquest. And the one thing that I was constantly searching for, but I didn't find when I was writing the book was a ghost story, but concerning, concerning this room, because I figured four people died in this room where there were ghosts involved. And the people that I spoke to who had lived there said there wasn't. But then I finally spoke to a girl, a woman, who had lived there back in the 1970s when the house had became a quote unquote hippie house. It had been this house that was like kind of a rundown farmhouse that a bunch of hippies lived in. And that she said while she lived there that there were noises and things coming from that room and nobody wanted to sleep the night there. So I'm still also waiting to somewhere out there to get a picture, an actual picture of the house because all I've seen is these uh, drawings and it's just I've, I've searched around New Jersey and I actually find houses that are similar to it with the same kind of um, circular uh, lights and one of the fortunate things for me is I had an extensive discussion with a man who actually lived in the house during the 1950s and he told me a lot about the house which I describe in the book about how it was a post and beam house uh, it was um, you know, and just the, the construction of it and the layout of it, which was very valuable to me as I wrote the book. So the question is, did Willard Thompson and Henry Baker, and one of the reasons I call him Henry Baker Pearson is some people called him Henry Pearson and some called him Henry Baker. And a lot of the reason why they called him Henry Pearson was they didn't want to kind of focus on that relationship between Henry Baker and the Baker family meaning the, the relationship uh, that was based on slavery. So they kind of would call him Henry Pearson. So I call him Henry Baker Pearson in the book. But did he kill Lucretia and Gertrude on March 1st? And I say to people out there, read the book and decide. And one of the things I've been thinking about is if I could uh, create a, a movie for the Franklin Park tragedy, uh, who I would cast, I would cast for Moore Baker, a young Ed Norton, as I look, I'd say to, you know, just seeing the pictures I've seen, he kind of, he's kind of would fit the role. And then for Lucretia Baker, it would be Elizabeth Moss. I tried to figure out who would Gertrude be, the young girl. I couldn't really find any existing actresses, so I thought of Tabitha from uh, Bewitched, that kind of look for her. And for the two attackers, I thought 
Michael uh, B. Jordan and Keenan Thompson, because to the descriptions of the uh, attackers, uh, they said of um, Willard Thompson, he was kind of a, a, a tall, handsome, young, thin man. And then uh, Keenan or kind of fits the role of Baker, which he was more of a stout uh, kind of man. But both of them were considered, the reason I have them smiling here is they were, they were well liked in the community uh, prior to the incident. And then for the what for the mother of Henry Baker, I thought Regina King would be the perfect one who would be confronting the farmers, indicating that she felt her son and Willard Thompson had been framed for the crime. And then for John J. Baker, I thought Pierce Brosnan would be a good choice. So soon in a theater near you, the Franklin Park tragedy. The end. And this just to give you a little uh, information here, the Grave here, you can actually, if you go down South Middlebush Road in the cemetery that's there, the Pleasant Plains Cemetery, in the back of it, you will find the grave for Lucretia Evans and Gertrude uh, Evans, or Lucretia Evans Baker and Gertrude uh, Baker. And the weird part about this particular marker, Moore Baker is also buried in the same uh, grave and he's on the marker. So they're all there in one place. So it is kind of a, an unusual kind of marker. So do I have any questions? Thanks, Brian. Um, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the questions box in the dashboard. Um, first question we have is why would Willard and Henry have been in the bedroom? That is always the question that people ask because that's probably the biggest twist. And one of the things I've thought a lot about this is the room in the back uh, was actually a place where there would be things stored and there was actually a back entrance there. And the room itself where the murders took place was not the master bedroom. I believe it was the bedroom that was used for the child. It was kind of like the child's room and there was a bed in there. So they may have actually come in there and not really known that the child and uh, the mother were in the next bedroom. And I think they may, if this is one theory I have, is they could have been actually tricked to go up there. What also happened was that they had gone on this trip uh, with his carriage earlier. And some of the theories are that they were actually going on a trip to sell uh, an illegal horse in Dayton and come back and actually get paid or you know for that or to provide the money to him uh you know for what they had got for that sale so that's one of the theories but you're right that is the biggest twist is why they would be up there um and in that kind of i think was one of the things that you know creates a mystery but that's a good point any other questions Ready. Um, nothing very, uh, so they could have walked into the scene of the crime? Yes. I mean, one of the things I had thought of was the idea that people like Thomas Buckingham and others have had is that Moore Baker killed his mother, his wife and daughter first, and then they had actually came in and then he killed them is kind of the assumption. It didn't happen all at the same time is, is kind of some of the theories that have been put out there. Uh, and the thing that is my my one friend who was a police officer from in New York City for a number of years, I'd done a presentation of this and he came up to me afterwards and he looked at me and he goes, the husband did it, you know, because <laughs> he said, generally speaking, when you have a murder weapon that's used against two of the people and then it's, you know, used against a third person, um, it's usually by the same person that's doing it. That was kind of, you know, um, no, but again, the theory that it, you know came out in the newspaper was is that uh, Moore Baker got possession of the axe and then you know killed Willard Thompson with the axe. As somebody asked, it, is the movie actually happening? Those are great choices <laughs> for actors. I would love to. Uh, I mean, I I've, I actually have a script written, and I hope to submit it. I just haven't got around to it, but uh, I, I think it would be a great movie. Any other questions? Um, 
Where do most of your research happen? Most of the research took place using newspaper archives because unfortunately there's not a lot of primary sources concerning this case. And so as I started going through the newspapers, I, I looked at, I have to say, probably hundreds and hundreds of different newspapers from all over the country. And most of the best sources were the ones that were from New Jersey and New York. Uh, a lot of the other ones were ones that were just kind of rehashes of the same stories. But most of my information comes from newspaper accounts. Uh, did you get a sense of how other people in other places viewed the incident? Um, yeah, the, the, the way people viewed it, a lot of it was on racial terms. It was black criminals came into house, attacked family, killed wife and um, daughter, and uh, husband was the Avenger. That was pretty much the story that was presented nationally and internationally. And that's really why the story was popular because it presented a narrative that people wanted to hear. And I think what may have happened is after the inquest took place, people in the community may have questioned the facts, but they didn't want to overturn the, the car as far as what had happened. It was socially not like acceptable to kind of change things. And that was kind of the thing I, I just, when I was talking to the sister's family, I'm like, why didn't you guys say anything at the time if you and i think that was she was a woman who didn't have a lot of rights in those days and really probably wouldn't have been listened to and probably would have been marginalized you know even if she had doubts um did you come across any resistance to the the expulsions of the african americans from the community um, from the African Americans, well, I didn't find any resistance from the African Americans. What basically I think the farmers did was they either gave them money or they threatened them, and they didn't really, from the newspaper accounts, they didn't really indicate what kind of threats were provided, but the assumption would be that it was, you know, physical threats. I would think, um, and then what happened, you saw a change where, and one, oh, one thing I didn't bring out in this was, this was not the first expulsion. 12 years earlier, they had expelled everybody from Franklin Park uh, as well because of a similar, not a murder, but some type of racial incident. And so over those 12 years, people had come back and then they expelled them again after the, the Franklin Park tragedy. Um, and when they would expel them, they'd go to live like in South Middlebush and other towns around the area, but they wouldn't be living in that area. It was almost like creating an exclusive white community where the you know, black, red, black people could not live. Oh, I want, just wanted to put, well, add one point. Sure. And uh, there is a, uh, the governor of Georgia actually used the incident as propaganda because he wanted to make it shown that up north, they were just as bad about racial expulsions as they were in the south. So he made a big point about the Franklin Park tragedy and how the New Jersey residents had treated, uh, you know, their black residents in saying that, you know, they're always criticizing us, look at what they just did. Um, and so that was one of the things that I found in one newspaper account in Georgia. Uh, was there any mention of any sexual assault of the mother of the baby? No, there's nothing, nothing sexual at all, um, you know, from what we've found. One theory that um, Thomas Buckingham had was Lucretia Baker had head injuries, and he said that if she had been strangled, that maybe the X of the head was used to cover up the, the strangulation, because if you were someone strangled, they have a certain expression on their face. And that was one of his theories of possibility of why the X would have been used. But I don't know if that's true. That's just another theory, but. Um, was it determined if this was uh, Moore's X or did they bring it? It was his ex. It was actually, uh, supposedly, according to the story, is the two men came outside 
uh, picked up two axes, went through the basement um, doors, the storm doors, took the shoes off and left them outside. And uh, as they were walking through the dark uh, basement, they made some noise and they upstairs, they kind of heard it and thought it was the puppies in the downstairs living room and just went back to sleep. And that the one guy left his ax downstairs and the one brought his with him. That was the story that Moore Baker had. But it was Moore Baker's ax. It was from his uh, wood chopping pile. Uh, what happened to the artifacts that were given to the museum in New York? Um, I went and tracked that because I'm very fascinated with museums. In fact, my next book is about lost museums. Um, and uh, what happened with the museum was they actually had this display. It went on for a number of years. And then eventually uh, the museum closed and they moved out to um, uh, Coney Island. And they had a version of it out there. And then there was a terrible fire that took place. And I believe it was in the 1920s and the, the museum burned. So I assume that the artifacts that were there probably burned in that fire. But the one artifact that I have is that the church, uh, the Six Mile Run Church, they recently renovated their slate roof and you could actually get a piece of the slate from the roof. So I actually got my own piece of slate of, uh, the, of the church where the funeral was. I don't see any more questions. Uh, Cindy, do you want to take us out? Yes, I will do that. Thank you, Andrew, for all the logistical help you give and, and reading the questions and that. Brian, thank you so much for uh, helping us to know this story that is really a forgotten story of racial injustice. And, you know, for us to be able to go forward, sometimes we need to know what's back in the past so that we can not um, do it over again, you know, not repeat it. So I just, I really appreciate it. It, it was very good presentation. And uh, I'm going to look forward to some of your other books that you say about the little known museums and that. So um, keep us aware of what you're uh, doing so that we might be able to have you back on those kind of things as well. Thank you so much for, for being here. For everybody uh, that, that attended, thank you so much. Tell your friends if you thought it was really interesting, you can go to our YouTube um, channel the new jersey state library look for the virtual author talks and you will find that there once we get the recording down it has been recorded and, and they'll be able to view this talk as well so thank you everyone i hope the rest of your day goes well take care <laughs>